Good morning, and welcome to the July 5th of 2020 Tapestry Video Gathering. I hope your week has been a week where you have seen uh, God, where you have experienced some of His joy, some of His peace, some of, of His comfort. My only request for all of us this week is that uh, we try to reach out some, to someone. Make a phone call text message, email, message, I don't care what you use, uh, write, write snail mail, I mean, it doesn't matter, but reach out to someone, please. Uh, let them know that, that you care for them, let them know that you miss them. And uh, as we have more information, I'll pass it on to you. Leadership team's gonna be meeting and hopefully uh, making some decisions. And uh, we just wanna make sure everybody's taken care of, okay? If you would join with me in praying, we will begin are gathering together. Please join me in prayer. Most gracious God, creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who we trust in because you are the only one who is trustworthy. We come before you acknowledging our dependence upon you asking that you chase away from us uh, any thought of independence from you. When we put up false idols, tear them down. When we do not rely upon you, place your presence in our life in such a way that we, we realize what we are missing. Forgive us for the ways that we sin against you. And remind us that you always call us back to you. Now, as we weekly try to worship you, help us together to proclaim how great you are in such a way that we remind each other of the truth of that fact. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's begin with Scripture. Psalm 86, verses 1 to 10 and 16 and 17. O Eternal One, lend an ear to my prayer and answer me, for I am weak and wanting. Safeguard my soul, for I remain loyal to you. Save me, your servant, who trusts in you, my God. O Lord, please be merciful to me, as all day long I cry out to you. Bring joy into the life of your servant, for it's only to you, O Lord, that I offer my soul. O Lord, you are good and ready to forgive. Your loyal love flows generously over all who cry out to you. O Eternal One, lend an ear and hear my prayer. Listen to my pleading voice. When times of trouble come, I will call to you because I know you will respond to me. O Lord, you stand alone among the other gods. Nothing they have done compares to your wonderful, wonderful works. O Lord, all the peoples of earth, every nation you established will come to you, bowing low to worship and rightly honor your great name. For you are great and your works are wondrous. You are the one true God. Look at me and grant me your favor. Invest your strength in me, your servant, and rescue me, your handmaiden's child. Give me a sign so I may know your goodness rests on me. And so those who hate me will be red with shame at the sight of it. For you, O Eternal One, have come to my aid and offered me relief. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in a marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither drinking nor eating, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a gluttonant and a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 
Come to me, all who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Spread out the sky over empty space. Except that there be light to a dark and formless world. Your light was born. You spread out your Forty-five, verses 8 through 14. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down.
Hello Threads. This is my second time to try this because the last time I had a bug fly into my mouth and uh, that kind of messed everything up and uh, was also thoroughly sniffed by some neighbors walking some dogs. So uh, I left my Bible at the house and I'm in the middle of some woods behind my house as you can tell. And so therefore I'm going to read the scripture from my uh, sermon transcript right here. Hope you're okay with that. This is what the word of the Lord says. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some are unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. Uh, if that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous uh, in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Now, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who testify, uh, justifies the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Now, Guys, one of my favorite little phrases from the Bible is from the prophet Amos. And it's not really one of my favorite phrases because of anything that helps with faith. I think it's a wonderful way of, of recognizing that we not only have firsthand knowledge sometimes, but sometimes we have secondhand knowledge. Uh, Amos is talking to someone and he says in the 7th chapter and 14th verse that I am neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. And I love it because it recognizes that sometimes you know something not because you're an expert on the field, uh, but because you are related to somebody who's an expert on the field. Uh, case in point, so I was raised by a uh, dental hygienist. My mother was a dental hygienist at one time. I've never studied dentistry, but I'd be willing to bet that I know a little more than the average Joe or Jane, uh, not because I studied dentistry, but because she studied dentistry and some of that rubbed off on me. I know more speech and language pathology than you can shake a stick at uh, because of the fact that I have three people in my family who studied the field, uh, I, one of which is a bona fide expert on it. 
I am neither a speech pathologist nor the son of a speech pathologist, but I am the husband of a speech pathologist. So I bring this up because I want to use it right now. I am neither an epidemiologist nor the son of an epidemiologist. At best, I am the friend of an epidemiologist. Hey, David Strong, how are you? So what I'm about to say could be completely inaccurate. I trust in people who have studied this and are experts in their field, and I trust their knowledge on it. But I fear and think that we probably will not have college football. Probably not what you thought I was going to say there. I just don't think we're going to have college football this this, uh, fall. We may have pro football. College is a different story. And therefore, I'm going to talk about it for just a brief little second. And if you don't like sports, don't worry. It's not going to be much of the, the message, okay? But it's probably one of the few chances I'm going to get to talk about college football, so I'm going to do it. And I'm going to talk about my uh, favorite team, which is the University of Alabama Crimson Tide. And if you were to ask somebody to describe, you know, what are they known for, it'd probably be four things. Winning, okay? This year was not a a perfect example of it, but we're known for winning, okay? We have more uh, college and national football championships than any other team. We're known for great defense, consistently great defense. We're known for consistently good running backs. And we're known for consistently terrible kickers. It's really just amazing. Alabama kicking is just awful. And uh, it's not even because we get bad kickers. We'll bring in these five-star recruits, the, the best recruits you can get coming out of high school. And they'll come to Alabama, and for some reason, suddenly they're terrible. Like, we have famous kicks that have happened that have lost the game for us. I bring this up because you could say that the word on Alabama kicking is that it's terrible. It doesn't mean it's universally true. It doesn't mean every kick's going to be uh, bad. But it means that the general theme is the kicking's always bad. And the passage we read today has Paul, Paul describing two words of general themes of his in this letter. Now, the reason I bring this up is uh, that in biblical studies, you have these ologies. Now, ologies being uh, a a, a kind of transliteration that comes from the word logos, which is the Greek word meaning word, but it also means study of. So uh, when you see English words that end in ology, that is logos, but it means study of. So biology is the study of life, or psychology, which means uh, soul or mind, is the study of of the soul or the mind. We have all of these ologies, but another way ology is used is you could say something is someone's anthropology, and what you're meaning is what is their general view of humanity? Some people would say they have a high view of, of uh, humanity, as in they're expecting uh, holiness, and other people have a low view of humanity. Uh, and it means they're not expecting all this, they're expecting sinfulness. Actually, Scripture has both, okay? We are a little lower than the angels, and we are fallen and in need of repentance. So, this passage we read, though, has two of these ologies for Paul. His anthropology, his general view of humans within the book of Romans, and his theology, his general view of God. Now, I want you to think for just a second on on the way we kind of use that, okay? Again, it doesn't mean that every statement Paul's going to say fits in this. It's just a general understanding. So, like, we do it all the time. If I say I bring some cheese from Rudolph, you know that generally means it's going to be high quality. If I say that um, somebody told a dad joke, you you know that means it's generally corny because for some reason all of our dads tell uh, corny jokes. I don't know how that works, but it just seems to work. Paul's general views here. Well, let's talk about it, okay? His his anthropology, his general view of humanity, this passage and the two chapters beforehand that we've read over the past five weeks, he describes humanity as sinful. One of the the verses from this passage that's that's really well known is Romans 3.23, where he says that all have fallen All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 1, he defines the Gentile world, and then he says everybody there is, even though they knew uh, God through his invisible attributes, they've denied him. They've all sinned. 
And then he says, all the Jews have. And then he comes back to that in this passage and says, neither one of them uh, have an excuse. His general view of humanity is that we have fallen and we have sinned. Now, I think most of us would, would say that we could see that. But the problem is, is I think generally, as humans, we don't live like it's true. If we did, I think two things would happen. One, I think we would respond in forgiveness. See, when you expect someone to sin, you're not surprised when they sin. Uh, there's this, this wonderful podcast I listened to called The Mocking Cast, and they referenced another wonderful podcast I listened to called Invisibilia. And they were talking about this view of humanity that uh, this anthropologist found in the Berber people in North Africa. The anthropologist's name was Matthew Carey, and I'll put a link up to the the article because I I thought it was very interesting. His his study of 12 years with the Berber people found out that they have no concept of trust. As a matter of fact, the only time he ever heard the word that they would have understood as trust, it was in this one sentence that he heard over and over again, which was, there is no such thing as trust. They didn't trust each other at all. And so he would see these friends who would, would break each other's trust and then their relationship would fall apart and then months later they would be back together. And he would ask them why and it was like, because you expect people to break your trust. When, when you expect people to fail, you can accept their failings. We need to respond in forgiveness to people because there are no true heroes. <laughs> it's why the internet has this this idea of a milkshake duck, which I just find fascinating. If you've never heard the term milkshake duck, it was invented by this cartoonist. Uh, he was trying to describe this phenomenon that happens within the internet where someone's lifted up because they have this great story and then suddenly you find something in their backstory that, that makes you go, oh. And so he described it by drawing this cartoon of a, a lovely little duck drinking a milkshake. And then in the next panel, you find out the duck's a racist. So we see these milkshake ducks where they're lifted up and you're like, oh, this is wonderful. And then you discover that something terrible is in their background. We can't really have heroes anymore because of this, because we expect people to be perfect. And the, the, the reality is we live in a fallen world. We are all engulfed in the power of sin. All of us need forgiveness. All of us need to to forgive others and receive forgiveness from us. And if we begin to recognize that humanity has fallen, I think we can give that to each other. But it also means that we can truly repent. And, And there's a difference, okay? See, I think quite often a lot of us are are good at saying I'm sorry, but we say I'm sorry to cover up sin rather than exposing it. And repentance exposes sin. Repentance is calling something evil and sinful, turning 180 degrees to do the exact opposite, and trying to correct whatever you did if you could. Our society is really good at apologizing without ever repenting, because we don't actually view humanity as fallen. See, apologizing, saying you're sorry, it still tries to protect some semblance of self-righteousness. It tries to hide what you've done. You you admit just enough to to get somebody to forget about. But what you're really trying to do is push your, your wrongdoing in the back to where it's not remembered. Forgive and forget. Repentance is literally exposing the evil to the light. Because that is what can cleanse it. See, Jesus calls our sin up to where it's known, where we are suddenly known for exactly who we are. And then he washes us white as snow. So often, we want Jesus to wash us white as snow without our dirty laundry actually being known. But that's not how repentance works. I I think so much of this is the case with with a lot of the, the... the racism that has been brought up. People want to forget about things without actually repenting about things. And then we do the same thing with people who go against the racist. They can't forgive. When we really recognize that humanity has fallen, I think it helps us to forgive and it helps us to repent. Paul's other ology is his theology, his 
his general word about God. And I think that comes into to repentance and, and forgiveness also because he says that God is faithful. Here, here's what he says in the passage. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true in every human being lying. A liar, not a lion. <laughs> Guys, God is faithful. When Paul tries to describe the general word for, for who he thinks God is, it comes back to faithfulness again and again and again. One of my favorite words on God's faithfulness comes later on in the book of Romans. In Romans 8, he says the following. He says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is faithful. He's faithful to his word that he will have wrath and vengeance against evil. So therefore, we don't have to seek vengeance because God will take care of it. He will judge. He says this, he says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. God is a God of justice. Evil will be judged. But we can trust in the midst of that judgment that he is always faithful to forgive. Ephesians 1 says the following, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. This passage we just read says that, that we won't be forgiven through the law, but we will be forgiven through Christ Jesus. It's an act of faith. See, our world expects us to, to be righteous. God understands that we, we still live under the power of sin. We are powerless when it comes to sin. But sin is powerless when it comes to God. And He is faithful to His Word he is faithful to his people. He is faithful to his creation. Yeah, I started off by talking about uh, Alabama football and, and how when you think of Alabama kicking, you just think of terrible kicking. We need to be entrenched in, to soak up these words of Paul, his word on humanity, his word on God, we need to remember how desperately we need forgiveness so that we might accept others when they need forgiveness. And we need to not be afraid of actual repentance. It's such a, a horrifically scary but beautiful thing. Actual repentance where we don't hide the evil we've done, but instead, we trust in God's faithfulness that he will forgive us. Your God is faithful to you. Even when you're not. Even when I'm not faithful to him. He is always faithful. It's who he is. It's Paul's word about who God is. I hope you know that faithfulness. I think it enables us not to live in fear that we will somehow lose, lose God's love, that eventually somebody will find out who we are, and if they really knew who we were, they wouldn't want to be around us. God is faithful to loving you. So therefore, love others. Would you join with me in our closing prayer? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I hope you know God's faithfulness.
that he is faithful to the ones he loves. He is faithful to you, no matter what. Live that out this week. Share that this week. And in so doing, praise God. Have a good week, guys. Hello, kids. We are still talking about Moses, and we're going to talk about um, Exodus 13. But let's review really quickly. So remember, the past two weeks, we had all of the plagues, the grasshoppers, the lice, the water turning to blood, the frogs, all those terrible things, and Pharaoh still wouldn't let the Israelites leave Egypt. And then finally, last week, we had that sad thing where God told the Israelites to take a lamb and to eat the lamb and use the blood and paint on the side and over their door. And he was going to kill all of the firstborn sons, except for if people had obeyed him and painted their doorpost with the lamb's blood, that he was going to pass over them and save them. So that happened and Pharaoh finally said, yes, you can let my people go. So now the people are leaving. They are finally free and they're leading, leaving Egypt and Moses is leading the way. So Moses took the children of Israel from Egypt into the desert. God went ahead in a tall cloud every day. Whenever the cloud stopped, the people stopped and they set up their tents until the cloud moved again. God was with them every night in a tall pillar of fire. God kept them safe. Sometimes the cloud would stop for a long time. Then the cloud would move. Follow the cloud, someone would shout. Everyone would hurry about packing up their beds and pulling down their tents. It was a busy time, but God's presence in the cloud only moved as fast as the old people and the little children could walk. Moses knew that God was always with them and would take them safely to their new land. So God was leading them by day with a cloud and by night with a pillar of fire and that way, as they left and went on their journey, they were kind of scared because they didn't know exactly where they were going. But God used a cloud and fire to show them that he was always there with them. For a little craft of that, to remember this story, you can um, see that I have two toilet paper tubes and you can put some glue on one and some cotton balls I didn't have cotton balls, I had cotton facial pads, so I just kind of tore them apart and glued them on. You could also use tissue. And that's your pillar of cloud. And then I cut out some construction paper in orange, red, and yellow, made it look like flames, and that's my pillar of fire. And that way I can remember that just like God was with the Israelites and he reminded them that he was with them with the clouds and the fire, I can remember that even today, God is still with me.